Hey everybody, thanks for joining me. It's time to keep our book study going for the summer. The Incredible Catholic Mass. Here it is. Boom. This is part three of what I think is going to take eight parts to get through the book. We're going to be looking at chapter five, six, and seven by God's grace. And so thanks for joining me. Am I looking at the right end of the camera? This is where the camera is. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of the Mass. Thank you for the gift of this uh, book. And help us by this uh, sacred study, this time of of uh, contemplation of the mystery of the Mass. Help us to love and participate in, and above all, live the mystery of the Holy Mass. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. And off we go. Chapter 5. First of all, let me just say, I hope you're in, enjoying this. Uh, I've already received a lot of great comments about uh, this book, um, that it's uh, it's challenging in a way, um, but, but deep. And so hopefully if you've uh, been joining me already, you're getting something out of it. Now, this there's going to be some repetition here. I'm going to move a little I'm going to a little quicker through chapter 6. I want to focus especially on 5 and 7. But uh chapter 5 is called in in the Holy Mass Christ renews his nativity. So, keep in mind where we've been. If you haven't, I'll get you up to speed. What you're going to have in the mass is the the whole mystery of Christ is presented or represented, especially his great work of redemption, his suffering, death, and resurrection, and ascension into heaven. But in a more broad way, his, the whole mystery of, you might say, the event of Christ, anticipated in the Old Covenant through foreshadowings, and now fulfilled in his own person, his life, and his death and resurrection. But this mystery, is access, he makes accessible to us through his sacraments, especially the Holy Mass. This is part of what makes the Mass in the English title of this book incredible. Incredible, not in the sense of um, impossible to believe, but incredible in the sense of amazing or uh, awe-inspiring. Notice, please, in the in the title of the chapter, it's really important. It's Christ who is renewing, remembering, making present his nativity. Of course, he has the authority and the power to do that because of who he is as God. So all of the life of Christ, including his work of redemption, is accessible through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is his spirit, um, and of course, by the power of his, uh, his divinity. So we're zooming in on certain aspects of his life, and here it's his nativity. We had looked at his incarnation, and here it is his nativity or his birth. So I'll just point out a couple, um, I think, interesting aspects to this. Um, behind everything that's really going to be happening in this chapter and the chapters to come is the mystery of the coming together of the human and divine nature in Christ. Notice on the top of page 79, we hear uh, this. How great the satisfaction of the Holy Spirit on beholding him whom he had united to the Father from all eternity in the closest bond of perfection of a perfect love now by his operation joined so intimately to human nature that the two natures so infinitely distinct and diverse were united together in the one person of the God man. That's you might say the principle of the incarnation God the Son infinite in his divine nature assuming to himself a human nature such that the two are linked together. That's called the hypostatic union. Hypostasis in Greek means person. So it's what glues them together, so to speak. It's the person of Jesus. It's who he is. He, who is he? He's the son of God. And by nature has a divine nature. And now through the incarnation takes to himself a human nature. Behind this is the Great statement of the Council of Chalcedon in the year, ooh, am I going to remember? I think 451. And that's where it says the two natures come together without mixing, mingling, separation, or confusion. I think I got those uh, adverbs right. Without mixing or mingling, they're not changing into each other. They stay distinct, which is what he says here. The two natures are distinct, and they're utterly diverse. You couldn't imagine a greater diversity between God and any created, any created nature. For all sorts of reasons, which we won't get go into now, um, but also without separation or division, Christ doesn't have two halves. He's not schizophrenic. He's one person, and united in this one person are two natures. So this is the mystery of the incarnation. But what it's interesting for us in this book study is this is going to be the logic behind so much of what is happening in the mass. You're always going to have sort of to use an analogy. Of the incarnation two natures at work the visible and the invisible the ceremony and the grace 
and uh, so on and so forth. So that's the logic that's going to make what he's doing in these chapters, not just wishful thinking. Like, oh, isn't it nice that this um, thing that happens at the mass makes you kind of, it, it kind of symbolizes this or that. Well, it's like, who says? Well, it's the, it's the logic of the incarnation, which is going to set up how these symbols are going to uh, function with respect to an invisible mystery. Okay. Same point here. He talks about the life of uh, St. Joseph Cupertino in the middle of page 79. And it's this kind of a um, vision about the three kings returning to their countries uh, uh, and pilgrims flocking after the three kings to see the king of the Jews, to feast their eyes on his wondrous beauty. Um, now, was Jesus more beautiful than other babies? Well, I don't know. The text doesn't seem to suggest that he had like this perfect Gerber baby face. But what's happening as they, they press to their hearts, like Our Lady, this baby, they're feasting their eyes on his wondrous beauty. Well, what's so wondrous about the beauty? He just looks like a normal baby. Well, through the eyes of faith and what's been revealed, what's, what's revealed by like the angels is what there's an invisible mystery of the, tr of the, of the Godhead present here in this baby. This baby is God. God has now become this baby. So that's presupposed uh, in here. Um, I like this too. Now he's going to transition from that moment of the event of the nativity of Jesus, a historical event. Now he's going to see that same mystery is at work in the life of the liturgy. He says, although we rightly count the, those privileged persons happy, the ones who actually got to go to the, the uh, cave and see the newborn Jesus, yet it must not be forgotten that we are even more privileged than they, since we may daily gaze with the eye of faith on that tender infant and may share in the gladness attending his birth. There's a great church father. He quotes here Pope uh, St. Leo I, but um, St. Gregory the Great said, the mystery has passed over into the mysteries. The mystery of the capital M is what I just described, the incarnate Son of God in human flesh. With his all of these events of his life, the nativity now, that mystery, has passed over into the mysteries. Mysteries mean, being the Greek word for the sacraments. So we gaze on the infant Jesus, but we see not a baby, but we see the Eucharist. But it's the same who with a different what. Fast forwarding a couple pages here. On 81, he's playing with this idea of how the nativity is going to be something we experience, but it's going to, it's the same mystery, but experienced in a different way. He, um, what does he do here? He says, suppose our guardian angel were to say to us, rejoice my child for now in this mass, thy savior will be born for thy, for thy salvation. Thou wilt see him with thine eyes under the form of the sacred host. Um, should we not rejoice? So he's comparing the angels going to the shepherds and your guardian angel saying, go to mass and you're going to experience this. But do you see the analogy? Well, all they see is a baby. All we see is the blessed sacrament and its outward uh, appearances. Uh, wonderful. So on 82, let me make you a little comment here. You might find helpful. He's speaking here now about the appropriateness of the form of the Eucharist at mass. He says, this Jesus, uh, the son of God, he's quoting an angel in this little kind of story, whom a few minutes ago thou didst see under the form of bread. He is now present as he, he is now present as he really is. Fear not, but rise up and take him into the arms. And let thy heart rejoice in God, thy savior. The story is of this um, priest, I think, a certain priest who Jesus appears as a baby in the Eucharist. Now, I think I mentioned this to you before. That's a kind of Eucharistic miracle, right? So Jesus is taking the form, not of um, a bread, but the form of a baby. And there's a certain, you, the, the, the form or the sign is always going to have a certain telos, to use a Greek word, or end. And when you see what a thing is, you always see what it is with respect to what it's for. It's just how the human brain works. So you look at a cup, it's for drinking. Look at a light, it's for turning light. Look at a car, hey, that's for driving. Um, when you look at a baby, it's for what? You just do it automatically. It's for holding, it's for protecting, it's for loving, it's for playing with, it's for um, bringing to maturity. That's just, that's just built into baby. What is bread for? Well, it's for taking and eating. That's just 
what it is uh, ordered to. Um, I love it here too. It says after he stood up was after he this prayer the priest stood up and he saw the blessed sacrament once more in the form of a consecrated wafer and consumed it with singular devotion. Thank God, right? Because babies are not for eating, but bread is for eating. So the appearance of the bread um, means that Jesus wants you to uh, consume him this way. Um, so Jesus appears as a baby, hold him. Jesus appears under the form of bread, consume him. Okay, he makes a nice little analogy here between, which I never thought of before, between the, the appearances of bread are like the swaddling clothes wrapped around the baby. Here's what I think is actually neat about that. It's an analogy that's only going to get us so far. Here's where it gets us. The swaddling clothes, the baby is is hiding behind them, so to speak. Um, the, the sweat, imagine the baby's all wrapped up in the swaddling clothes all the way around. So it looks like this lump of clothes, but it's in fact a baby. Um, and the baby is not, you might say, in a substantial union with the swaddling clothes. The clothes can come and go. It's still a baby. The baby is in a clothing relationship and a concealing relationship with the clothes. The clothes conceal the baby um, as, even as it's wrapping up the baby. So with the, with the appearances of bread, the appearances of bread and the appearances of wine, they conceal the presence of Christ. You don't see him there. You see the outward appearances. And um, again, it has a certain end or there's a reason that sign, this outward appearance is telling you something about what's inside. In the case of the babe, in case of um, the, uh, the appearances of bread, hey, this, the one who is here wants to be consumed and to get, get inside you and nourish you and give you strength. Where the analogy doesn't get, where it limps or it breaks down is with swaddling clothes, Jesus actually was wrapped in swaddling clothes. There's real swaddling clothes there. They're not, it's, he's not a naked baby with just what appears to be swaddling clothes. In the Eucharist, he, he's wrapped himself in what simply appears to be bread and what simply appears to be wine. There's, no, there's not the substance of bread and the substance of wine after the consecration. Great. Why does Jesus come to us in these sacramental signs, especially of the Eucharist on 83, to give the opportunity for the exercise of faith? I trust you. I trust your word. Okay. Okay, wonderful. I'll jump over some of this stuff here. On 85, a little thing about this um, Saxon who has this Eucharist, Eucharistic miracle about the infant Christ being truly present. Let me just point out that Eucharistic miracles, technically speaking, don't produce faith. They don't. What produces faith is the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit could use a miracle as a, the occasion by which he gives someone Eucharistic faith. But the miracles themselves are always a little bit like attention getters. They're meant to point, to lead a person to faith, but they don't actually produce it. Um, you know, miracles are funny, funny things. Even Thomas Aquinas himself had a funny relationship with Eucharistic miracles where um, they're, they're sort of inconvenient because they sort of go around the normal way in which the Eucharist works. Like, um, when the precious blood would spill, so it left, in, in one case, a, a blood stain. And someone said that to Thomas, and he said, well, that's funny, because usually the precious blood leaves a wine stain. In other words, normally the, the, Jesus comes to us through the, these sacramental appearances. Again, not in these like overwhelming, mystical appearances. The miracles are effective because they, they, they kind of point to the reality that there's a great mystery concealed by the sacraments, but they don't, necess they don't produce faith. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Uh, working in the human soul. Okay, nice little section on the joy in heaven and the blessings brought to earth. Um, the, the joy caused caused in heaven. As you read this section, let me just point out to you, there's this there's, there's thing in here about um, how pleased the father is with the son, or how, kind of how happy and how much joy it gives the father when he sees the son come down on the altar. Y yes, that you want to watch out for a little anthropomorphism there, like in the in sense of, um, the things we do at mass sort of produces an emotional effect in God. That that's we're dealing, of course, with the mystery of God here. But you want to be careful with that because um, God doesn't change. I think what what you can say about the joy of God is He He rejoices in seeing human His creation, especially human beings, participate 
in what he wants for them. He needs nothing. He doesn't get an emotional boost because he gets something he didn't have. That's not proper to divine nature. So the joy God gets uh, in, in the nativity and when that's renewed in the mass is like, what joy did God get? It's creation participating in his glory. That's what's happening in the incarnation. That's what's happening at the nativity, right? Here come the animals. Here come the shepherds, the holy family, and, and this, this participation. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. It's the mystery of the Trinity now expanding into um, and sharing that mystery with uh, creation. Okay. Let me just say, too, one thing to watch out for here, too, is... Oh, no, let me point out 89, a wonderful thing. He says on 89, For only the sacred humanity of Christ, united in his one person to the Godhead, and thereby, and thereby divinized, is capable of rendering to the Godhead a tribute of praise, of love, of glory, worthy of its infinite majesty. Yeah, there's actually a lot going on there, but let me just point out that you see the word divinization or divinized, to be made God or made like God. I love that too, because that's an idea that really gets reclaimed from the church fathers in the 19th and 20th century. But this provides the backbone for that. The sacred humanity of Christ is the, the example par excellence of divinization because he's God. We worship his human nature. His human nature has, so to speak, become God through participation in his divine nature. Now, whoever participates in Christ is going to share in that divinization. But so divinization doesn't mean like you become like Apollo and you get your own planet or something like that. It means that whatever you have happening in Jesus, this divinization of, in, of him, which he has in this infinite, powerful way, like a super saturated humanity in the hypostatic union, that we, we, when we're united to Christ and share in that by grace, we share in that divinization. Um, and I love it how in 89 in the middle he says the angels can't even begin to understand what Christ is doing in his mysteries in his nativity and in his life because they can't understand what the Trinity is doing because only the Trinity can understand that. Okay, great. 91, here's just a little thing I want to say, watch out for. It's 91 and 92. He says, um, for in his temporal birth, he was made like unto man and took upon him the form of a fair and beauteous child. Great. In his mystic birth, however, he assumes the form of bread and appears to the outward vision as a piece of bread. Nay, more. So entirely does he abase and annihilate himself so as to keel him, conceal himself in the minutest particle that the eye can discern. That's good Catholic theology because it's what's called the doctrine of concomitance. Every particle of the Blessed Sacrament, Christ is fully present there. He's not up in little bits. That he, he, he commits himself under all the appearances of the Blessed Sacrament. And that is a, a, an expression of the divine humility or self-abasement, as he says. God comes down to be a human being and lowers himself even more. But the lowering, it's, the analogy doesn't, you don't want to push the analogy too hard between God becomes man and God becomes the Eucharist. Here's why. Because in the Eucharist, you've got, in the incarnation nativity, you've got the Son of God taking to himself a second nature, a human nature, assumed it to himself. And the, he, the two natures now are utterly united. And they're both intact. Fully God, fully man. Now, that God-man converts the substance of bread and wine into his own mystery. But what you don't have here is the bread and the bread and the and Christ come together like the in, in the incarnation. It's it, that's actually kind of what Luther taught. It's called consubstantiation. The problem with that is now you've got three natures, God, man, and bread, and that doesn't work because even though the divine nature of God is such that it's utterly non-competitive so it can unite itself to a human nature, but a human nature, which remains intact in Jesus, cannot be fully united to the substance of bread. I mean, when you eat bread, the bread becomes you, but the bread, insofar as it becomes you, it is annihilated. Um, Jesus isn't annihilating his human nature, um, and he doesn't, I wouldn't say he, you wouldn't say he, what happens to the bread is a whole nother theological question, but the bread does not remain. So like in 92, he uses, he says that he's confined or imprisoned in a little wafer. I'd be, that's, I'd say just be careful there because it's not like Jesus is hiding inside a piece of bread um, where, he, or he becomes small and white and round. Like sometimes I heard someone say one time, father, can you make sure that 
that we leave the air conditioner on in the church because we don't want Jesus to get hot in there. Well, that's just a misunderstanding of if the appearances of the bread get warm, it doesn't mean that Jesus is getting warm. The mere appearances are getting warm. So we're dealing with the mystery of his true presence there. A lot of this is saying what's not the case. There is no bread. Jesus um, is fully present there in his body, blood, and soul, humanity, and his divinity. Um, under the appearances of bread, but he, to say he's a prisoner there, it's more, it's, I get it, what it's trying to get at, it's the humility of his concealing, but we don't want to have, like, sympathy for him, like, oh, poor Jesus, he's, he's hidden inside the bread, and he can't get out, so that would be, like, pushing it too far, um, okay, I don't know if that's helpful, okay, just great stuff, six, I'm actually gonna fast forward quite a bit here, the chapter six is in the holy mass, Christ renews his life on earth, Here's the main claim of this whole chapter, which is actually short in 96. He says, If our eyes were enlightened by faith, this sacred spectacle would fill us with intense joy, for Holy Mass is a brief compendium of the whole life of Christ and a renewal of all the mysteries comprised in it. Not indeed a fictitious portrayal of past events, but a real and actual repetition of all that Christ did and, and suffered upon earth. That's a pretty bold claim. I think most people, Catholics who are, have some catechesis will have a sense of it's the Last Supper. That's somehow that we're mystically participating in. Or the Last Supper and the cross. Or the Last Supper, the cross, and the resurrection. But he's going so bold, being so bold as to say it's the whole life of Christ. Well, how can he say that? And that, that's, I think, what we want to consider here. Well, first I say a few things. One is... Um, if you keep the incarnation as the principle behind this, the, the God and man come together in Christ, two nations come together. So that there's nothing that Jesus did in his human life which is separated from the divine nature and therefore the divine eternity. The event of the cross and resurrection abides in a unique way because that's Jesus's hour. But that's not separate from the rest of his life in some radical way. From the moment he's conceived in the virgin's womb to his birth, his life, his, his teaching, his miracles, his hidden life, um, all the way up through his, to his resurrection, all of that participates in the divinity of God and the eternity of God and therefore can be accessed wherever Christ is. And the, he's saying the mass here is how it's, how it's presented. So it doesn't sound so weird. Like, it, like we're, our job is to kind of force a kind of false allegorization on the mass as if it's always, you have to like relive the life of Jesus every single mass. Consider that the whole liturgical year each year is a reliving of his whole life. Think of it, right? Advent is where it starts. He's born. He teaches. Lent goes into the wilderness. Suffers, dies, rises. Holy Week sends the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and then he's Christ the King. So that's like it's like zooming out, and you are getting a whole sense. Think and the, just the the lectionary itself. You're going to move through the whole life of Christ in all four Gospels, and you're going to get Old Testament foreshadowings, and you're going to get the New Testament commentary on how it's being fulfilled in like the epistles and so on. So this makes sense because of the incarnation. It makes sense. I think you see in the lectionary and the liturgical and the liturgical year cycle. It also makes sense when you consider <clears throat> the mystical body of Christ. So it's not just Jesus reliving these things for himself. Now, he, as he moves through space and time uh, as his body, the church, um, his whole life is now passed over into the lives of human beings who live a human life and their lives, once baptized, now belong to him. Um, when I sleep, Jesus is sleeping in me. When I wake up, Jesus is waking up. When I struggle with something, he's struggling with me. When I read the gospels, those are, that's my life because I'm a member of his body. When, he's, when my life is playing out, his life is playing out. This is the mystery of Christ having one body. Here's what I found. So um, that's all kind of the theology behind this. But I do like how in 97 he'll say, okay, now let's zoom in on one single mass. And it is kind of mind-blowing when you can consider how the pattern of his life does match more or less. We you know with some, some maybe things where, you know, it doesn't match up perfectly, but pretty darn well. He says, um, issuing thence on the night of the nativity as from the sacristy. He began on his entrance into the world, the introit, which is the commitment of the mass. So this this word of God, he comes forth from the womb. He comes forth from the sacristy. That's kind of cool. Um, the cries he uttered in the crib were the cry that Kyrie lays on, the glory is sung by the angels, 
the collects, when he spends the night in prayer, the epistles, the, his teaching, the gospel, uh, the fullness of that teaching, the offertory, of course, is the ob oblation of his perfect humanity, uh, the preface, his praise to God, the Sanctus is what is, is the Sanctus is Holy Saturday. He enters into Holy, into Jerusalem, the Holy Week. Sanctus and Mass, we enter into the Eucharistic prayer. The consecration, of course, is the Last Supper. The elevation lifted up on the cross. The, I never heard this before. The Pater Noster with its seven petitions matches the seven words of the cross. So we'd have to think about that. So do a little thinking about that. The seven famous phrases or words that Jesus says on the cross. Do those kind of match up in some way with the seven uh, articles of the Our Father or petitions of the Our Father? Very interesting. And then communion is the anointing of the Lord's body, laying it in the tomb. His body is laid in the tomb and his body is laid into um, on the altar, which can be like a sepulcher or laid into his into the darkness of our own bodies. And the blessing at the end of Mass is the blessing of, it's the Great Commission when he says, go forth and uh, ascends into heaven. And then he leaves from sight, like the priest leaves from sight. So I think that's all cool. I don't, I don't feel like that was too, forcing it too much. Um, he, I think the big picture here is as we gaze with keeping the life of Christ in mind, we should try to map that on to the mass. So that as we watch the mass, we're not just watching a ceremony or this, this priest doing something interesting thing or whatever. We, we're, we're, we're kind of mapping on the whole life of Christ, the whole mystery of him, his coming, life, death, resurrection. And now I'm, I'm bringing my life into communion with that. Just as like the shepherds and the Holy Family were be, coming into communion with that. Think of Mary just tracking along the whole mystery. Her life and his life are now working together. That happens to us in the Mass. And the Mass sort of makes, this, makes, us, uh, makes it present to us. Okay. Now let's just go to chapter 7. See if we can get through seven here. We're shifting gears a little bit here. In, in the Holy Mass, Christ renews his intercession. So we've moved from the incarnation, the nativity, and now his role as the, as the intercessor of our lives. He's going to intercede for us at the Mass. This is the work of a priest, a mediator. So in general, I think he's using here the, the mediate to mediate and to intercede, deeply connected, if not uh, interchangeably. Here's a word you may want to go to the glossary at the front for St. John, the beloved disciple of our Lord, says in his first epistle, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the just, and he is the propiti propitiation for our sins. The glossary in the front says that propitiation means, why am I having a hard time saying that? Propitiation means to, um, to make favorably inclined, to appease, to uh, conciliate. Conciliate literally means with, with eyelashes. Uh, so reconciliate means to like turn eyelash to eyelash again. To conciliate is simply to be eyelash to eyelash. eyelash. You know, when you're face to face with someone, you're, you're turned towards them, you're kindly disposed. Um, you're not happy with someone, you look away, right? So propitiate is to do that, to turn towards, to make uh, favor, favorably inclined. And so the work of a priest is to make God favorably inclined to us and us favorably inclined to God too. So to reconcile through his intercession, God and man. Yes. So what Jesus does as the high priest here on page uh, 104 in the middle, as often as the sacrifice of the mass is offered, so often does Christ plead both for those who offer it and for those for whom it is offered. He's, he intercedes for the priest and he intercedes for the people. Jesus is the primary one who's doing this. Um, there aren't a lot of prayers in the Mass where the priest will pray for himself personally because of his own sins. And then, and then he is manifesting the work of Jesus, the high priest, in his office as priest. By the way, that is um, fractal. <laughs> That's been one of my favorite words lately. Fractal means a pattern which repeats, goes down or goes up, bigger or smaller, smaller or bigger. Fractal. So Jesus, the high priest, who mediates between God and man, and then fractal it down, and it's the pattern of priest to the people. It keeps going, actually, by the way. You know, you could say the father is the priest in a family, uh, etc. Um, okay. As I was reading this chapter, what was just coming to me, my, my mind, was just this image of Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews when uh, Paul or the author says that in the days while he was in the flesh, Jesus offered loud cries to God and he was heard because of his um, obedience or because of his righteousness. I think obedience. 
So loud cries, um, crying out to God on behalf of us. So that comes through, I think, so beautifully here. Like on 105, St. Ambrose saying, not for himself did he pray all night long, but for me. So when Jesus prays, his prayer is like uniquely priestly and pure because he never prays for himself in the sense of propitiation. He never prays that he would be kindly disposed to the Father. He says, the Father and I are one. Uh, the Father is always with me. Father, um, glorify your son. Father, I pray this for them, not for me. I know you're always with me, etc. So there's a there's an infinite purity to his priesthood. And when he prays, it's always for us. It's always priestly. The incarnation is not for God. The incarnation is for human beings. Um, how does he pray on 106? He's not just praying with vo his voice. He's self-offering. So in 106, the word there is immolate. At the bottom of 106, Consider well and admire profoundly the inscrutable manner in which our blessed Redeemer immolates himself in every Mass for the welfare of all believers. Immolate means to, um, to sacrifice, uh, to, to offer as a sacrifice, to propitiate. You immolate to propitiate. You sacrifice to bring about, a to be favorably inclined to reconcile. Please know here, I think if you're Catholic, you probably already know this. If you're not Catholic, or you don't understand this, it might sound like Jesus um, is re-immolating himself uh, every time at Mass. That's, that's not precisely what this means. He offers himself once on the cross, and, that, and then he renews that in the, the Eucharist. So what is he doing? He's offering himself. How is he doing it? Not in a bloody way, but in an unbloody way. One sacrifice, which is manifest or participated in, in a different way. We'd say in a liturgical way, a sacramental way, um, a, an event in time and space, which you can see, touch, taste, and smell here, which uh, by faith participates and through the grace of God participates in in what he actually does Holy Thursday and on, the, on the, the cry of the cross pleading for us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How does he immolate himself um, on the cross? It's through his self-offering on Holy Thursday. Um, it, that's what makes the cross a sacrifice because Thursday night is the beginning of the ritual. This is my body given for you. On the cross, his life isn't taken from him. His self-offering and, and Holy Thursday, which is linked to it as a Passover sacrifice, um, that's, it's consummated on the cross. That same mystery now is represented. Jesus himself is representing that through the words of the priest. This is my body given for you. Not these are the, this is the body of Jesus. This is my body. He's speaking there in the very words of Christ. Great. This is a Trinitarian act, by the way. Please don't think with propitiation and immolation that it's like Jesus is trying to make the Father uh, change his mind about punishing us. This is a this is a, a Trinitarian action. It's not like the Father's like, you're going to do this, and the Son is like, ah, oh, I'm not going to do it. Okay, but I'll do it because you're so angry. It's a Trinitarian act. So on... um. On 107, you can see that the highest powers of heaven are incapable of fully comprehending it. So it's the Son and the Father are united perfectly and through the Holy Spirit. And that's how, that's how you always want to understand what's going on in like page 108 with um, the anger of God. God's anger, um, which all three persons of the Trinity share, right? Jesus has the anger of God. Uh, it's not like God the Father has this, this anger, but the anger is not, it's not emotional in God. It's out of his love for us. Think, for example, just for a human analogy, of a mother who has a, a, a drug-addicted son. Does that make her angry? Y yes, but in, this, in, in the measure that she loves him and wants what's best for him, if she's an emotionally healthy mom, she, um, she's angry because these forces are destroying her son and he's using his freedom in a destructive way. Something like that. Again, it's just an analogy. But they, God is offended and needs to be propitiated. It's The need is not on his side. The need is on our side. We need to be, um, we need the propitiation. We need the immolation of one who can make us worthy, restore us, overcome guilt, heal us. That So just be careful that we don't project into God the needs of creatures or at worst, the emotional states of creatures, okay? That can get a little bit, uh, a little bit dicey. Okay. A uh, lot of we could say here, gosh. Um, so most of this chapter is highlighting Jesus at Mass is interceding for us, and we should just delight in that. 
Um, he has his line, I can't remember where it was, but like, it, oh yeah, it's on 109. If we delight in the Blessed Virgin Mary interceding for us, going to Jesus and interceding for us, making up for all of our inattentiveness, just like the way that someone who is, someone who had access to someone, a family member, and they said, don't worry, don't worry, I'll go talk to him. We would just naturally feel like, oh, thank God, because that person is like way closer. They're going to put in a good word for me. How much more should we rejoice that one of the members of the Trinity is interceding for us? Think about that. The one who is consubstantial with the Father, the one who says, when you see me, you see the Father, the one who says, I and the Father are one, um, he's interceding for us. So it's not, I mean, it's it's bold, but it's not untrue to say the Trinity, there's, there's intra-Trinitarian intercession happening because of the incarnation. The Son of God, yeah, he sends into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father where he does what? He intercedes for us. And that's happening all the time, 24 hours a day, all the time. It's now like this eternal reality. Um, but in the mass, we experience it. This day, this week, my needs here, what's happening in the world, Christ is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. So um, it's just the, the confidence that we should, we should have in that. That's a very letter to the Hebrews too, isn't it? When Jesus says, um, what, what, a, what, what a high priest do we have who can sympathize with us gives us confidence of access to the Father. So I just love how he's kind of stirring that up. Like we shouldn't act like, oh, I hope, I really hope God hears my prayers. I really hope, come on. Jesus is your intercessor. So bring bring him your needs. Let him be your high priest. Let him intercede for you. He takes it one step further, which is awesome. Not only on the bottom of page 111, not only does he intercede for us, buckle your seatbelt. He, here's what I found. Siri, I'm about to say something really dramatic that we intercede with him. So it's a participation idea. So the bottom 111. Um, from all that has been said, we now understand full well how powerful and how earnest is the prayer Christ offers for us upon the altar and how beneficial is its, its effect on, upon us. Only one thing yet remains. Here it is. That we should unite our prayer to his. Or rather we should implore him to make it one with his. This is, I think, a kind of proto-rediscovery of what we call the general priesthood. When you're baptized, you're baptized prophet, king, and priest. You're anointed. Yeah? Your, your, your head is anointed. What are you anointed to do? To do what a priest does. To offer sacrifice. To intercede. To mediate. That's what a priest does. Now, there's two, two uh, qualitatively different participations in the priesthood of Christ, the ordained priesthood, but the general priesthood of the baptized is massively important. When you're baptized, that's when you can go to Mass. That's why in the ancient church, if you weren't baptized, you couldn't go to Mass. You couldn't, I mean, the Eucharist, you couldn't celebrate. Why not? Because you're not a priest yet. Remember St. Peter in his first letter, he says, you are a nation of priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. So what do priests do? We offer sacrifice. Um, but now, it's a participation in his, in, his high, in his high priesthood. So the way this looks at, at Mass, for example, is... Jesus is interceding, interceding for me, yes. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't even know what to pray for. So on one level, Jesus is just interceding for me, and I just have confidence in that. But I don't just stop there. Because I have an intelligence, and I have a will, and I, and I can exercise faith, hope, and love, that in the Mass, and I'm just speaking here, let's just say I'm a baptized man and not an ordained priest. I'm bringing to Jesus my prayers, my, my intercession, and I'm participating in his his prayer becomes mine, my prayer becomes his. His intercession becomes my intercession. My intercession becomes his. They're not equal, of course. Uh, they're infinitely not equal. But by sheer grace, he invites us to be a nation of priests. And that means intercession and participation. This is not a rubbing a magic lamp. This is not, okay, that means if I want a Ferrari, now Jesus is going to have to ask the God for a Ferrari. No, of course not. Because we're praying in his name, which means we're, we're surrendered to his will. Um, it's, you know, it's the mystery really of prayer. That he, he wants us to pray. The Father knows what you need, he says. But ask but ask him. Ask him. Tell him what you need. So somehow the Lord delights in sharing or inviting us into a kind of share in his priesthood. So we should be rejoicing at the priesthood and intercession of Jesus that he's interceding for us and how, what confidence that should give us. And the Mass revives and strengthens and we experience it there. Um, but also we should uh, exercise the priesthood in the way that the Lord has given it to us so that we are uniting our prayers to his. What are you, what are the, what are you praying for? What are you interceding for at Mass? We should be very conscious of that because our 
our mediation, our priesthood is extremely important for the people in our lives. That's not an addition to Jesus' intercession. It's a participation, or you might say a refraction, a manifestation of his um, infinitely powerful intercession. That's what the Mass, that's one of the mysteries that the Mass makes present, Jesus' priestly intercession. Next time, let's do chapter 8 and 9. I'm not sure about 10. We'll do 8 and 9, and hopefully that's a blessing. See you soon.